Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. That the God of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Praise the Lord. That is what we should all be desiring. In the knowledge of him. Not knowledge of demons, not knowledge of... At times we know many things. But the most important thing is this. If you have knowledge of him, if you have knowledge of who he is, knowledge of the Son of God, because this was Paul's prayer for these people. Ephesus was a place where they had idol worship like crazy. You get it? Ephesus was so bad that they wanted to, you know, like in India, India right now I think they're about a billion people. But by the time India was about, there is a time they were what? About 600 million, they had about 370-something gods. So each two people could comfortably have their own god. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, they didn't think he's not hearing them. They had full attention of their god. Each, <laughs> each two people could have their own god. 375. So Ephesus also had many of these gods. And... Just in case there is one they had not gathered, they still made an altar for him and say, to the unknown God, they sacrificed to him. So that in case he just shows up, they are not guilty. He said, we used to worship you. We didn't know you, but we had an altar. Come see, we had an altar for you. <laughs> so Paul comes and introduces them to this unknown God, who is meant to be the only God. He introduces them to this God. And Paul in Ephesus he doesn't spend time teaching them on spiritual warfare. He doesn't spend time pulling down strongholds. You get what I'm saying? Pulling down strongholds is okay. But the way we pull them down geographically, that, that's not what Paul was talking about in the Bible. You get it? That's not what he was talking about, pulling them down from to you. You get what I, So you go. We pull you down we, into our church. Don't pull them down into this church. <laughs> But you see that Paul stayed in Ephesus for more than, I think, more than two years. It is the place he stayed most, where there was most idol worship. And he taught the word. The Bible says in the, that the word prevailed. He stayed there until the word prevailed. He taught them. So we see in the prayer he's praying for them. Look at the prayer he's praying for the Ephesians. That you may receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Your eyes being flooded with light that you may get to know the hope of his calling, riches of his glory, the exceeding power, that exceeding power toward us that raised Christ from the dead. This is the prayer that he's praying for the Ephesians. And you can see the things he writes to them. From Ephesians 1, you are seated in heavenly places, far above all principalities. This is what he's telling them. He's telling them Christ was risen. He, he sat. Then he tells them later, you are also in heavenly places. He speaks. He shows them who they are. And he spends two years. And the church in Ephesus became one of the most powerful churches in the world. Timothy was the bishop of the church in Ephesus. Hallelujah. It didn't become strong by him going and digging up things, identifying things they had. Asking them, where did you plant it? That was not. Paul realized that since these people are in such bondage, they need the word. Because the Bible says in Psalm, Psalm 119, I think Psalm 119 it says, The entrance of thy word bringeth light. Yeah? Now it tells us in John 1, darkness could not comprehend the light. When the word comes, darkness cannot stay. So it is a trick of the devil many times to divert us and think. So if this place has a lot of idol worship, has a lot of witchcraft, we should spend... That means that you as a Christian, the only thing that keeps you busy is the devil. You're not led by the Holy Spirit. You're led by the devil. You get what I'm saying? 
You are led by the devil. I told you of this one time we went to minister in is a place pastala. It's called Kawede. So I'm ministering in Kawede. And there is a lot of witchcraft. Many mad men, many. So I stood at the stage and I, b- 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 no, the, uh, the, some of the ministers that were there that were hosting us, they're like, now you see this place has this and this. So tomorrow before we go out for evangelism, we should wake up at, is it four? I don't remember. But very early we should wake up and we deal with these territorial spirits here. We deal with them and what? And I told them, no, no, no. It's not the devil who sets my prayer timetable. It's, it's not the devil. You get it? Yeah, so I'm going to sleep. Because actually I was going to wake up and pray at five, but now I decided to sleep. I'm like, no. I, the devil can't set my timetable for praying. So I'm like, me, I'll be sleeping. I'll wake up and I'll go cast out those demons. Then in church I told them, look for the greatest witch doctor in Kawede. This is my phone number. This is my name. You get it? Why do they target weak people? Let them send their best shot. So go tell every witch doctor in Kawede, let them send their best shot to me. And I'm not going to spend the night praying. I'm going to spend the night sleeping. They can spend the night chanting and doing whatever they want to do. Because it's not the devil that sets my program. As many as are led by the Spirit of the children of God. So you've never prayed, then the devil shows up, you start praying. So who is leading you into prayer? It's the devil. <laughs> because when he, when he was not there, you didn't pray. When he showed up, he led you to pray. He said, oh, there is a witch doctor here. We should become more serious. No, the witch doctor should be the one telling that to his children. There is a child of God here. We should become more serious. It, it, is, it is the witch doctor that should be saying that. Praise the Lord. So this... this Let's go, to, let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. We read this last Thursday. I'll read it again. Stand fast, therefore, <laughs> in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Stand in the liberty. Don't allow this liberty to be stolen away. When you got born again, you came into our liberty. That is why every year we teach spirit, soul, and body. Because when the average Christian, the way they function, they don't understand that they were brought into our liberty. Because they've never understood spirit, soul, and body, and it's functioning. So they will sing songs that are powerful, then say different things. You get what I'm saying? You, they, they, they will come and tell you, oh, now we, 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 we need to deal with this. There is this thing in our family. We need to deal with it, with it. You see, don't give me that crap and come and talk about the cross again. You get it? How do you do that even? How do you talk about the cross and talk about that? It almost means that Jesus was not successful. The cross did not, the cross did not accomplish what it was meant for. And many have stayed there, entangled again in the yoke of bondage because they did not understand. And I believe that is why Paul is praying for the Ephesians also. He's praying for them. And this is what he goes on. He explains to the Galatians. If you, if you continue reading Galatians, you'll see he keeps explaining to them. He keeps explaining to them how they are free. How they are free. It is so amazing what the word does. Andrew Mark has written a book called Effortless Change. I attended a conference where he was preaching about effortless change. I was way back in college. Man, I was so amazed. The effortless change is the word of God. This is the effortless change. And like I've said this over and over, I receive many phone calls. People who need deliverance, people who need to be prayed for, for this and this. I receive many phone calls. And I pray for them. You get it? And next, somebody calls me, they are sick, they have this, give them a word of knowledge, they disappear. They call again three months later, something happened to their son. They call again seven months later, something happened to their car. They call two years later, something happened to their cow. (laughs) As in, they just, so you're like, which liberty are they living in? Which liberty are they living in? But you see, when you tell them, come sit under the word, this is wastage of time. 
you're not prophesying to me. You're not so they prefer the phone call because the phone call you will prophesy to them. You will, you, will, you will say something and it will happen. But you see, they can't see that they are bound because this God that they know that is powerful, that they serve, that they believe came into them, he's small in them. That is bondage. Yeah? If you read Legacy of Faith by T.L. Osborne, he asked that question. This God we worship, who is big, he created the heavens, the earth, the seas, he brought earthquakes, he healed people, he healed the leper and, and all that. He did all these great things. When he came into you, did he become small? Did he lose some of his power? But you see, many Christians act like that. Like he's big when we're worshipping him out there. But as long as he's in me, he shrank. He lost some power. He was demoted. That's how he came in me. That's how we worship him. That's how we talk about him. That's how we act. That is the yoke of bondage. Going back to that yoke of bondage. And yet, this is the effortless change because the more you get to know yourself, which happens through the word, you get to know yourself. There are things that you realize, like many of you who have sat here under the word for a while, there are things that you realize that you don't deal with anymore. And you don't even know what particularly happened. You, you just don't pray about them anymore. They are not an issue anymore. It is because you go to know who you are. You go to know yourself. You get what I'm saying? You got to know yourself because of sitting under the word. This is the effortless change. And that is why it is what the devil fights most. It is what the devil fights most. Everyone, even non-believers, will comfortably attend somewhere where they are just seeing miracles and being prophesied to, as important as those things are to us. But when it comes to let's sit down and study the word, people don't readily come when it comes to the word because they don't think it works. But it is the effortless change. It is this that grows you. It says you are washed by the washing of the water of the word. If we just start talking about the word, the things that the word does, you would be so amazed. You know yourself in the word. Many people who suffer with guilt, guilt ever, they come to church, they say, I, I think that time I sinned many years ago, I think he says it is the word. He says in Hebrews that he says almost all things are cleansed by the blood. You've read that in Hebrews? He says almost. In other words, not all things are cleansed by the blood. He says almost <laughs> all things are cleansed by the blood. I wish you could get us that scripture. But it says almost all things are cleansed by the blood. Why, are all, why, why is it almost? It is because your conscience is purged and cleansed by the word, by the washing of the water of the word. That is it. So you pray, oh, God, cleanse my conscience with your blood. Cleanse me with your blood. Cleanse me with your blood. <laughs> cleanse me with your blood. There is purpose for the blood, but Jesus told them, you are cleansed by the words that I speak to you. You are clean because of the words that I speak to you. He washes the church with the water of the word. That is how he washes the church. And you see, so there is uncleanliness that goes away by the word. There is uncleanliness that may not be seen. I don't want to get into this so much, but I'm just giving you an example. Like just things like the, what the word does. Although this is just one of the things. There is uncleanness that may not be. Let me, le, le, an example is you're seated on a matatu. People start uh, quarreling on the matatu or they start saying certain things that are not clean. You get it? You're seated on a matatu and they are going to be saying, there is no man that does not cheat. You should just thank God that you never find out. You get what I'm saying? That is uncleanness. And it is going to get in your mind. And the devil can start using it because you're going to start thinking, may it be true about my husband. You get it? Now you start meditating on that which is not pure, which is not true. You get it? You're yielding to the devil. So you've not sinned because you didn't go for it you're not the one who said it. 
or you're in a hotel, especially in Europe or America, wherever, they have TV channels that are just for pornography. And you see you're flipping the channels and pornography shows up on screen. You didn't go looking for pornography. And you see that image stays in there. You get it? And you see the devil can use it as a basis to, to, to sin, to cause you to sin, to bind you. Like many people are bound, many people are bound in pornography, but their introduction to pornography was not that they went after it. You get it? They, it just it came where they were, either on their computer or something. So now you see that is uncleanness. It is not that you sinned, it is uncleanness. That uncleanness can only go away by the washing of the water of the word of God. The more you sit under the word of God, it is erased. The more you go into the word of God, it is erased. And many things, hearts from the past, from your parents, from your siblings, from your... The word cleanses you from some of those things. Because you're going to realize that some, some things, it is not you. But the more you get in the word of God, this is, I gave you this example on Sunday, we're talking about love, as called to love. And I was giving you Joyce Ma's example. She wanted to love, she knew loving is the right thing. But you see her dad had raped her more than 200 times. And you see she, she struggled with that. Like God, where were you? I was just a child, why didn't you protect me? You see she didn't sin. But you see there is uncleanness that was sown in her. You get it? Hatred towards her dad that she, she didn't just wake up and say, let me hate my dad. Something happened over and over and over and over. And you see, definitely she's, she's Pentecostal. So, people must have laid hands on her a lot. Thank God she didn't go bald. Hallelujah. She must have gone for a lot of deliverance. Lay hands on me. I want to receive God's love. Lay hands on me. I want to forgive my dad. Then she was late. But you see, she realized that I have to take the word and believe it. And for more than I am, she stuck her nose in the word. More than I am. Every day she would wake up feeling like, is God really loving? But she goes, what does the word say? What does the word say? She read the word. And after more than I am, she fully experienced the word, the love of God. Fully experiencing the word, the love of God. And the experiences we get from the word, it is beyond emotions. It's beyond, you see, many encounters we have with God, like many encounters we've had here, they are spectacular. They, 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 they are dramatic. We get slain, we pass out, we shake, we cry. Many things happen like that. And many people, even as I've been sharing on Sunday and as I'll continue, many people have not fully experienced the love of God because they only know it as an emotion. Now the word of God takes it beyond that. Because it's true, right now God can rock you with his love. You'll feel his love like liquid oil just overwhelming you and you're like, wow, his love is like this. But it is possible that you walk out here and next week you're like, why don't I experience God's love? Because you see, you limited his experiences to the kernel. Most spirit-filled Christians are carnal. Because without a feeling, without an emotion, they can't relate with God. John 3, John 4, 24, tells us God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. Because he is, he is spirit. God is spirit. So if God is spirit, we relate with him in the spirit. He appeals to us, he finds us where we are. That is why you see when Jesus was, when Jesus was baptized and said, Oh, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. A voice came from heaven. Jesus turned immediately and said, It was for them that were around. Jesus didn't need a manifestation to connect to his father. He says it was for them. It was for them that were around. It was not for him. So, you see, the more we get in the word, we, Ephesians, he tells us Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. Ephesians 3, 19. 
that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. Hallelujah. And you see, when he tells us, as I have loved you, love one another, that means it is going to be beyond a feeling. Now, you see, to the carnal being, feelings are the most powerful thing. You get it? That is why we will do things that we do. That is why you will smoke weed. That is why you will get high. That is why, that is why you, you, because you see, that is, but you see, there is something that is higher, and the carnal mind cannot perceive it. What can be better than a feeling? The spirit. It is higher than a feeling and it is better than a feeling. And it is a reality. You get to know it and you know it. Praise the Lord. I had an experience where I got to know that God is good. Many years back. And nothing has ever been able to erase that. It is, not a fe- it is something beyond a feeling. Praise the Lord. Because before that I had feelings, I had experiences. When I got slain under the power and God spoke all some things to me, I felt good. I felt like he was good. You know what I'm saying? Then the other day my granddad dies and we've been praying for him. Then I was like, God, I really don't understand how good you are. You know what I'm saying? The feeling, it fades. That is why Paul says to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I came not in eloquence of speech, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Then he goes on to say, but when we are come to them that are mature, we impart a higher wisdom. In other words, when we come to them who are mature, we are not just appealing to the physical, to the carnal, to the sensual. Praise the Lord. That is why you see like when we go for missions, we go to new places, one of the first things is we must have manifestations. Because you see, that is the invitation. They start now when he says that these are the ones that received the word but did not have understanding. I was explaining that also on Sunday. That the, the word did not come upon them. There was, no, there was no reverential reception of the word. It is the same thing that happens with the experiences. So you see, when we go to these places and these people see the power of God, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, they are slain in church, great things are happening, they see these manifestations. Now, we follow that with teaching. So that understanding comes to them. Otherwise, this very experience that they've had is going to harden them towards the things of God because there is no understanding of the particular experience that they had. They had the experience, but there is no understanding of the experience. Back to, to today. This liberty that many Christians are not enjoying, it is because they've not taken on the effortless change. The word of God. So there is a liberty that you felt that day you, f- every one of us, I believe, if you genuinely got born again, if you didn't come in through the back door or a window or a ventilator, if you genuinely got born again, man, that day you got born again, you felt like you're the most free person on earth. You felt like you can fly. Now you're born again, you don't feel that anymore. You feel like my granddad did this. Oh, that we are in Kenya. The spirit of this. Who robbed you of your liberty? What you felt that day. And you see, that's the problem that you left it in the realm of feelings. But now when you get the word of God, you get to understand the liberty that you were bought into. You get to understand the liberty that he gave to you that is beyond a feeling. That even when you do not feel it, you know it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Man, I'm telling you, this that God has given to us, the whole world needs to hear this. The whole world needs to know this. Christians will walk different. Christians will walk with their heads lifted up if they get to understand this. That there is a liberty that we've been been got into. There is a liberty that Christ has brought us into. Now, back to Ephesians Ephesians, Ephesians 1.17. He's telling us about the... He's telling us there are three things he lists there that we should know. And if you know these things, there is no way you will be bound again. There is no way you will walk in in bondage unless you don't know them. So he says that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance 
in the saints. Now there are three things there. He says that you may know the hope of his calling. There is a hope. You may know the hope of his calling. Number two, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Let's go to 19. Number three, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word? Who believe according to the working of his mighty power? To us, who believe? As a believer, you're the greatest person. There is no one who is like a believer. No one is privileged like the believer. The riches of his glory that you have as your inher inheritance, the hope of his calling, this calling that he's called you into, calling you out of darkness into marvelous light, there is a great hope in that. Praise the Lord. And let's, go, let's, let's continue. Let's go to 20. The exceeding power that he's talking about of his greatness, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above. I'm so glad that he says far above. He doesn't just say above. Praise the Lord. So he's not just here. That the principalities are here, then he's here. He says, far above, far above. Even if they stretch their hands, the principalities, they can't touch him. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. If you like researching names of demons, every name, not only in this world, hallelujah, <laughs> not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. In other words, if he's made him head over all things and has put all these under his feet, his meaning, these things are under us because we are the body of Christ. We are the church. So Christ has no feet apart from us. So he's saying these things are under us. These things have been placed under us. So how do you come and start saying it's okay for Christians to be demon-possessed? How do you come and say it's okay for Christians to fall sick? These are the things that he overcame. And you see, because of not knowing the word of God, we defend everything because of being in the carnal realm. Whatever is real in the carnal realm is more real to us. It's the truth. We stop there. But don't we admire the life of Jesus? Who says Lazarus is sleeping? When in the carnal realm to them he's dead. Don't you admire Jesus? Who says, except the son of man, who is in heaven? And he's there standing with them. And he says, who is in heaven? Look at Jesus. Jesus curses a fig tree for not having figs in the season that they don't have figs. You get it? it was, the Bible says it was not the season to have figs. <laughs> but Jesus expected you to have figs. Praise the Lord. He's the only one, and this is the life that he's given to us, that can expect results from you when it is not the season. And that is why you can also reap when it is not the season to reap. You can also reap where you didn't sow. Because, you see, we got this eternal life. I think to this, Peter, they were wondering, why are you mad at the fig tree? It's not the season. All of us know it's not the season. But he curses it. Because he's God. <laughs> and that is why Paul tells Timothy, be instant in evangelism. In season and... Yeah. So there is no bad season for us. We can bear results anytime. As everyone is saying, this has been a bad year. Wait and hear our testimonies at the end of this year. Right now, we've not put them in order. That's why I can't start saying them. They, they are just scattered all over. So <laughs> I want to compile them first, then tell you. It, there is no, there is no, we can reap when, when, when everyone is not reaping. We can. Because we have him. This is a liberty that he's brought us into. That our eyes can be open. And this is a man who did not go by physical perception or carnal perception. 
He lived in the spirit. And that is what he's called us to. This is the life that he's called us to. So when he's telling us far above, he's given us this. You as a child of God, this is the liberty that you have come in. Like, how do you read such things and start being busy? The devil is fighting me. The devil is doing this. That. It, is, it is even unfair to the devil what you are doing. You get it? It is unfair. My daughter is 11 months. It's very unfair for me to come today and tell you how yesterday I did not show up because my daughter beat me. Oh, she beat me. She... You get what I'm saying? It will not make sense to you. Why? She's 11 months. How hard can she beat me? So, that is what God feels. Like, I, I thought the devil was under your feet. Like, you, you're talking about that. No wonder Isaiah says that when we will see him, everyone will wonder. Is this the one that tormented the world? You see, when the, that day when he's being held like this, being taken to hell, like, is that the one that tormented the world? Who gave him power to torment the world? That's the small thing. That is why the devil is not the opposite of God. It is a mere creation. And now even a fallen one. It's even in our worst state. Our worst state. That is why you, you never see anywhere in the Bible God dealing with the devil. That is our duty and angels. It, it doesn't take God to deal with the devil. Where? Oh, the devil is fighting for Moses' body. He sent Michael. Michael, go kick that guy. Michael is like, ah, no. Michael had been in the gym, working on his legs. He's like, this guy? No, I don't need. He rebuked him. He just spoke. <laughs> I rebuke you, devil. And he left. Even the angel didn't take strength. He just spoke, the angel. And the devil left. And when he showed up to Jesus, Jesus just gave him three scriptures. And I believe Jesus knew many scriptures. I just said <laughs> this guy. Just three, he will not take it. Three, and he will leave. And I'm sure he had prepared, because the devil had done his research. You see, he came with scriptures. That is research. He had been training, warming up, doing push-ups, 21-day challenge. <laughs> 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 And he shows up. And in three scriptures, all his work was put to nothing. In three scriptures. You know, he had been waiting since the Garden of Eden. He had been waiting for this moment. See, because they are the same temptations that he gave to Adam. The same three temptations. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride. They are the same. So he's been waiting for the Son of God. 2,000 years preparing and the battle is done in three minutes. It's done. Beaten flat. The, the Bible says he left as in <laughs> he, he, he didn't even try anymore. Have, have, you, have you ever fought with somebody more powerful than you? Or, <laughs> or try to run away from somebody you know that they are faster than you? You see, you don't act like the devil still. You know, you tell yourself, they would rather catch me, but I'm not stopping. <laughs> you know they are going to catch you, but you feel like if I stop, that's, that's a total loss. No, let them catch me. <laughs> eh? You say they would rather beat me until they feel like, hey, this guy, I've beaten him so much. The devil didn't wait for that moment. <laughs> the message version says, in Philippians, he says that, you see, we say he made a public spectacle of him. But the message version says he ripped them paraded them, walked them naked in the streets, ripped them of everything. Then you know when they hear Christians pray, they look at themselves and they're like, maybe we are not naked as we think. <laughs> you know, that's what they think. Maybe we still have some power. Maybe we still, and people will say, oh, but you see, the devil is like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. Yes, he may. I'm not one of those. He me. He's looking for those who don't know who they are. Those who don't know the knowledge of who they are in Christ Jesus. They don't know these three things he's given to them. The hope of their calling. The riches of his glory. Exceeding power with which he raised Christ from the dead. And he seated us with Christ in heavenly places. Far above all these. So we spend time there. 
And you see, the world loves this, especially Africa. We love this. Why? Because, you see, we've been used to toiling. So it is so hard. That is why he comes and emphasizes in Hebrews 4, and he tells us, labor to enter into his rest. You see, you don't labor to rest. You get it? If I want to rest, I just relax. I stop laboring. But God knew how human beings would be stubborn. <laughs> that for them even to rest would require labor. They can't believe it was done. They, can't, they say, oh, but you see, even Pastor so and so spent five hours casting out. Even pa What does that have to do with what God has said? What does that have to do with what God has said? That is your pastor. Praise the Lord. He was also still figuring himself out. <laughs> but God, <laughs> God was not figuring himself out. God said it. And that is it. His word is settled forever in heaven. And th th this is the man God has given us liberty. He's given us liberty. He's given us liberty. That is why he tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. And you see, it is so sad that Paul's language during this time, Paul uses a lot of military language. And this military language has been taken to mean that pe people took it to, to, to mean that we are ever on a fire. My friend, from the day you get born again, you're in a battle. It is true, but which battle was Paul referring to? It is because, you see, Paul, he's writing to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, it is believed he's in prison, there's a Roman soldier there, so he's looking at the helmet. He's saying, put on the helmet. He's looking at the breastplate. He's looking. So this militia language was because of what was going on during that time. This is the time Emperor Nero was reigning. And Emperor Nero was persecuting the Jews, especially those who had believed on Christ. And those who had believed Christ were a laughing stock even to the fellow Jews. You get it? They were the minority. Even Jews scoffed at them. So they were in constant battle. They had to fight to stand for what they believed. All the resources Paul had had that would make him famous as a Pharisee were taken away. So would be scoffed at. That what? <laughs> Has Paul lost his mind? That a light came on the road? A voice? Paul, we thought you were a scholar. We thought you were, we thought you were a smart man. You know, we are all Christians. But you know, we thought at least you studied. Why are you acting like those preachers who are not studied? The Antichrist. And it is what you've seen during this season. They scoff at that. They scoff at believers who are standing in their faith. So during this time, there was a lot like that. People were bitter. Christians were beheaded. They were made fun of. So there was a standing that they needed to do, a resisting. But it was not a resisting in... It was not a resisting in... Christ has not accomplished it, like the way we say it today. We take these phrases that Paul used in, because that time they, they made a lot of sense. It is just like right now, there are, phrases, there are phrases we use that will make sense today. You get it? But 2,000 years from now, maybe they will not be the phrases that are to be used. You get what I'm saying? But because of the times that we are in, there, there is language that we use even when we come to church. Language that will not mean anything in the years to come. Language that will not mean anything. And so, because of not understanding and interpreting the times and why Paul was speaking some of these things, we've interpreted it that way. So people read, he told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. So we come to church and we're like, we're waging the warfare of faith. We're waging the warfare of faith. So every day we are busy. Oh, you demons, you demons, you demons, you demons, you demons, you demons. You, we are just addressing demons every day. Demons, demons, demons. And fight of faith, faith means adhering to what Christ has done. That's the truth of Christ. Adhere to what Christ has done. So Paul is telling Timothy, I know there is a lot going on. There is persecution. Children are being killed in the church in Ephesus. Wives have been taken away from their husbands. The government is attacking you. But he's like, amidst all this, you fight to stay believing what Christ achieved. Never believe that the devil is in control. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight. Stay believing what Christ has done. Stay believing it. 
That is what he's saying. And you see, we don't see any scenario like that, even in Paul's life. Like I've told you, when he went to Ephesus, or all these places, you would see him do certain things. We would see him, we, at least we would have seen him do things that are done today that we see a lot in the church, but we don't see him do those things. We see him praise the Lord when he's in prison. He's not there in prison just, oh, hey, Silas, the devil is fighting us. The devil is fighting us. Imagine we were going to preach. No. He praises the Lord because he knows the devil is no match for him. It would be very unfair. It would be demeaning if we spent all this time just dealing with the devil. Isn't it sad that most of the Keshas are about that? We go and spend the whole night. So if you evaluate your life, the time you spend dealing with the devil is longer than the time you spent worshiping God. You're going to have culture shock in heaven. Because you're going to get there unprepared to worship for that long. <laughs> Because you know praying long means you're dealing with the devil. And you see, when this, this, is a, this is a prayer that you should also wish you can pray for yourself like Paul was praying for the Ephesians, that he may grant to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And because whatever Christ has done for you, a believer, it is from inside out. There is no power of God that is going to come from, that God is going to release to come to you. So as we grow in our Christian life, which is, I told you, this is the effortless change. As we grow in our Christian life, we learn to release from that which we already have in our spirit. So as we grow, that is what we are learning to release. So maybe at times, you know, you're casting out a demon, it's not coming out, you're trying this. You're, but you see, the more you renew yourself in the word of God, and don't get to believe what that, because the devil wants you to believe some demons are tough, some are, you know, people say, oh, some can, can't come out except by prayer and fasting, but you know that scripture doesn't mean that totally. He was referring to the unbelief. He was referring to their unbelief. Because they asked him, they asked him, why couldn't we cast him out? And he, he rebukes them for their lack of faith, for their unbelief. And he tells them, this kind cannot go except by prayer and fasting, the unbelief. I told you it's poor Bible interpretation to take doctrine, to build doctrine on one scripture. There is nowhere else we see in the Bible that demons are cast out by fasting. Praise the Lord. As important as fasting is, they are cast out by the power in the name of Jesus. The name that he's given to us. We have the attorney to the name of Jesus. He's given us that name. Praise the Lord. So, as you grow, you see, as you renew yourself with the word of God, you choose not to believe what you are seeing and believe what God has said. And that is how you start seeing what God has said. Because imagine, like, casting out demons is what he expects for everyone who believes. There is no serious qualification for that. When he says... These signs shall follow them that believe. In other words, if you believe, one of the, before even speaking in tongues, he says they shall cast out demons. They will cast out demons. As you get to know yourself in the word of God, you start now walking in this liberty that is called you in. You see, there is a time I told you I prayed for people to speak in tongues for a whole year and I didn't see anyone speak in tongues. And by this time, my mind had been renewed to know that that I can release it. And I believe renewing was still happening because I wasn't praying the wrong prayers. But you see, as I spent time believing the word of God because I prayed for people, I prayed for somebody, they didn't speak, another person came, I never, ever said I can't. I did it every day, every time. Every person I met who didn't speak in tongues, I would tell them, you're born again and you don't speak in tongues? Let me pray for you. And for more than I, I didn't see anyone praying in tongues. Then eventually I started seeing people praying in tongues. I didn't believe what the devil would have wanted me to believe. That maybe it is for certain few people to pray for people to speak in tongues. Maybe you're too young. By that time I think I was 17. I was 17, I was 16. Or maybe you would say, maybe I'm too young. Maybe I should wait until I become a pastor. I didn't believe any of those lies. I just saw. Paul went to Ephesus. He laid hands on them. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke in tongues. And I believed it, I believed it, I believed it. And I knew that in future when I'm to lead a ministry, when I have a ministry, everyone should be speaking in tongues. And you see, we made it a point. That's why every service we prayed, anyone who does not speak in tongues, come. 
And the truth is that I would be shocked if I pray for you to speak in tongues and you don't speak in tongues. I would be so shocked. Why? Because I'm not waiting for some power to come from heaven. I release it. I have it. And that is not arrogant. I know it. It is just like you telling me, if I tell you right now, I'm putting on white shoes. You see, pastor, you're being arrogant. No. I know it. I know they are white. You get it? So I know that I have this power. I know he told me to lay hands on people. I know I can impart. There is a time where I used to wait for things to come from heaven. Oh man, I waited. Then there is a day I discovered that they were already here. <laughs> they started happening sooner than I used to think. I said, like, oh God, do you really want me to lay hands on that sick person? Please give me a sign. And you see, you see, when you're still at that level, when you're still immature, he will give you those signs in the carnal realm. I'll not tell you what he used to, the signs he used to give me. <laughs> but you see, everyone I laid hands on, I'll be like, oh, God. okay, they've come, they're sick. God, do you want me to lay hands on them or no? Do you want me to lay hands on them? Then God would do something. And I'll be like, okay, let me lay hands on them. Then someday he would do it, do it, do it. And I'm like, hey, he did it for everyone in the line. I'm like, yes. After some time, totally stopped. It was not there. There has no sign because he didn't want me to stay carnal. He didn't want me to be 50 years old but sucking my thumb like many people in the church. Because you realize that these things that Christ obtained for you, you have. You have the freedom that Christ obtained for you. And like I was saying, that Peter said, such as I have, I give. Peter didn't say, I'm going to ask God to give it to you. I'm going to, he said, such as I have. He knew he had it. Look at all Paul's prayers. He releases from in. You get it? You don't see Paul praying for things like they've not yet happened. That is an insult to what Christ has done on the cross. It is making small of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. We come and sing, whom the sun sets free, whom the sun sets free, is free indeed. And we sing all those songs. We sing, we, 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 we sing, I don't know how many songs we sing, but we sing many, many good songs. But then you look at the life of the church and like, are those songs, are they just, is the rhythm nice, is the music nice, or do they mean what they are singing? You get it? I'm, all, I'm an overcomer. And we dance. You know, it's very good to dance. It is very good to dance to that tune. I'm like, Pasi, what the devil is doing to me? What were you singing? You were singing, you are an overcomer. What did you even mean? And this, let's go to, let's go to Galatians 5. Let's go back to Galatians 5. I want, I want to show you that this liberty is not actually stolen from you by the devil. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. And that is what he means, falling from grace. People think that falling from grace means when somebody sinned. You may not have sinned, but you're going back to achieve from your own works. So you see, there is no mention of the devil here. Actually, Paul would, Paul would have addressed it here. I command the devil to release that liberty for you. No. He's just going on to rebuke them. You guys, are you daft? Don't you understand? Who hindered you? You get it? I think that's in, is it in verse 15 where he tells them, who hindered you? You did run well. Who stopped you? You were running so well. So you see, we got born again and we sang. What, what, what is that song of joy down in my heart? Huh? And that joy, 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 joy down in my down in my heart. Down in my heart. And now, it does not stay anymore. You see, as long as you're in Sunday school, it's a joy that can stay. Then when you grow, like, oh, brethren, there are deeper things. 
there are days when the devil will steal your joy. And this Kesha is for the devil bringing back whatever he stole. Mm -mm. I don't want it. He, if he stole it, I don't know what he's been using it for. I don't want secondhand things. No, 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 I don't want it if the devil stole it. I don't want it. And you see, a nature of the things that God gives, it is you who will throw it away. But the devil cannot take. He can't snatch. It is you. So he takes, the devil doesn't drive cars, the devil doesn't, there are many things that the devil doesn't do. He doesn't use money, doesn't use Kenyan shillings. The thief comes to steal the word. Because if he gets the word, he's stolen everything. It is the word that he's after. Not is the word. He steals the word by making you believe something that is contrary to the word. If it's contrary to the word and you believe it, the word has been stolen from you. And we see that we, 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 with, with many examples even in the Bible, and yet we see people who are stewards of the word, contrary to whatever was happening around them, they stuck to the word. You see Mary, I think I've taught about that, Mary pondering on the word. It was spoken to her, a virgin. She's never seen a virgin, especially we who are pioneers. And you know, as Ratsi, we are pioneers. And God has called you to pioneer things. So when you're a pioneer, things are not just going to be easy. You're going to be scoffed at, even by the very people that you think. You see, in the last day, it says, lies shall increase, deception shall increase. It is easier now for people to believe a lie than it is to believe the truth. Even Christians, children of God, in the name of wisdom, we never see that in the early church. Praise the Lord. I, how many things first the early church and look at in Corinth when he's writing, I mean in Acts, he's saying there's a time when the prophet Agabus, when he prophesied that there was going to be a great famine, there was going to be lack, they gathered and sent things to other brethren. The ones that are going to be in lack sowed seed. Today it's called foolishness. This is what we see in the Bible. Praise the Lord. Child of God, there is liberty that God has brought you into. Get to understand yourself in the word of God. Get to understand what has been done for you. And walk in it. Be on our quest. He says, if you seek him. With the, you see, we normally read, we, we like reading how he has good plans for us. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. He has good plans for us to prosper us. To Why don't we read the next verse? 12. Huh? Okay, let's read it. Huh? I feel like 12 should be the more, should be the memory verse. <laughs> Not 11. <laughs> It should be 12. Then shall you call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Go on. And ye shall seek me, and find me, and when ye shall search for me, with all your heart. With all your heart. And that applies to the New Testament. Jesus tells the disciples, I speak in parables so that they do not understand. For it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but it is not given to them. It is to you that it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. God conceals matters for us. God does not hide things from us. He hides things for us. Things are concealed for us. That is why you get born again and things are put in your spirit. So you're like, why didn't they just happen in the physical body? Because you would not know how to use them. You would not relate to them if your mind is not renewed. You know what I'm saying? Whatever God is doing is coming from a different frame. That is why we get slain. That is why we shake under the power. As in just imagine, your body can't even take it. We worship God and his presence is just here because we are worshiping him. And your body can't take it. The natural can't take it. So imagine if every truth of his just came to you in the natural, you would just die. You don't, know how to, you don't know what to use it for. So spiritual growth is so that we grow to be able to handle what is already in there. What is already deposited there. But what is deposited there, we have to value it. Because you see, if you value it, you'll go after it. It is total surrender. It is this or there is no option. 
You get it? Like what I'm saying, I prayed for people for more than I had to speak in tongues. I valued it. If it had not happened, this is how many years later, more than 10 years later, I would still be doing it. I didn't have a time frame. I had not given God a time frame. If I pray for, for three more months and I see no one, no, there is no time frame. It was that or I didn't have a life. First of all, I knew that one of the things that is going to be very key in the ministry that God has called me to, at 17, I knew that it was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and people encountering the Holy Spirit. I knew. So then I realized that if that is part of what God has called me for, then speaking in tongues is the nursery for that one. So now if I don't pass nursery, how shall I go to group of schools? <laughs> You get what I'm saying? So do you value this? Do you, val do you value the liberty that is given to you? Or you just throw it away when a certain prophet shows up in town? When a new teaching that is trending shows up? There are many teachings that are going to come. Many trendy teachings. You see right now, one of the biggest teachings is the courtrooms of heaven. And it's okay get in the courtrooms of heaven. You go there. But one thing I know, I have an advocate. I'm, I'm, you see, uh, uh, there, there is somebody in the courtrooms of heaven for me. There is a witness who stands there forever. So as people are figuring out to go for themselves, take it to the courtrooms of heaven. Now, I've not even explored the teaching fully. You can explore the teaching. You can go on and explore. But I've not explored it fully. First of all, on that basis, on that basis that I don't see it consistent with, how many scriptures, how many times did I see Paul say, Ephesians, your devil worshippers, I'm taking you to the courtroom of heaven. Never do I see that. Paul has a thorn in the flesh and he doesn't say, take you to the courtrooms of heaven. So there are teachings that are going to come and they are trendy. But you see, you can know all you know about them and I don't know if they are wrong. You get it? I'm still growing. Maybe I'll mature and one day appreciate them. But you see, if you know them and you don't know the basics, you don't know the liberty, these are the teachings robbing you of the freedom you've been brought into. And this is what I'm saying. When I got born again, I'm saying, I have this joy, joy to stay. I, you know, we would sing of the freedom. I'm free. We sing, my sins were higher than the mountains. My sins were higher than the mountains. My sins were higher than the mountain, and the Lord set me free. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And we would sing, my sins were darker than what? My, they were deeper than the ocean. They were, then we would sing, I'm free. We, we, you know, we would sing how Jesus changed our lives. And that is why I like these songs. Many of these songs we had in crusades, we should bring them back to church. Because they were just songs talking about how we were set free. How we were set free. How we can now run. How we can now fly. Then... Somewhere growing up, I encountered school of prayer. I suffered. Guys, I suffered. <laughs> it was school of bondage, not of prayer. So do you must pray at midnight. You, you know I'm there. Oh, I didn't pray at midnight. Oh, Father, please forgive me, please. I quit relationship. Where is the rest he called me to? Throwing away the liberty that he had brought me into. Why can't I pray in advance for midnight? <laughs> Why can't I say, God, today I'm so tired, so at midnight I'll be asleep. <laughs> oh, midnight prayer. What? And you see, the issue is this. Somebody gets their personal experience and they make it doctrine. You see, maybe the original person who got the revelation, it was a real encounter with God. God told him, for this year I want you to be praying at midnight. You get it? Then they came and taught it us. Yes, yeah. When I was in college, God told me not to date. You know what I'm saying? Because of the call that was upon my life. Imagine if that's what I would be teaching today. If you're in college, you're not meant to date. No, that is what happens. You get what I'm saying? I've been to places. I've been somewhere and I'm praying for people. And God told me, get water. You pour water on them. You get it? So imagine if I came and started preaching us using water. Holy water. From carrying it. Holy water. 
Your hands are more holy than water. God dwells in you more than he dwells in the water. So there are many things the origin may not be wrong, but they are not meant to be doctrine. So some of these teachings that I'm saying, and it, at times it's dependent on where some of these things God does to quicken people because of where they are in the revelation of the knowledge they have in him. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So God will tell me, I want you to wake up every 4 a.m. I want you to be praying every 4 a.m. I want you to fast for four months. And you see, I've done all that. But if I came and preached it, you see, before, before, when I was just, before I began ministry, I went on a dry fast. I was just drinking water, tea, for three weeks. I didn't eat anything. That is when I got the name Ratsi. That is when I got the logo. God gave me a vision of the logo. He gave me the name Ratsi. He gave me what it's about. I just finished college. I finished college. I didn't go home. I packed my things from college and went to a prayer place. No one knew. I didn't even tell my parents where I was. I didn't tell anyone. And I was there for three weeks. So imagine if everyone here that is going in ministry I start telling you, you need to fast for three weeks before you begin ministry. So you see, where the origin was not wrong, it was something with, between me and God. But now when I bring it and make it doctrine, and that is why Paul, you know, and Paul says, moving on from the elementary things, let's move on to perfection. Most of the church has not even known the elementary things. Because people have not known who they are in Christ and they want to know the courtrooms of heaven. They want to know the uh, whatever spirit. They want to know the, uh, the what financial what. They want to know. You, you want to know everything apart from the basics. Why don't you get to know the new creature? Why don't you get to understand you as a spirit being? You're still figuring, you can't even understand how am I a new creature and you're busy going to the courtrooms of heaven. What will it benefit you? You get what I'm saying? Uh, you, like there are just many things that we are so deep in. I had somebody saying, oh, you see, when you get in the, prof in the prophetic, there are things that you should do. You see, in the prophetic, there's a prophetic binoculars. There's a prophetic... This person can't even explain how to be born again. They are telling me about prophetic binoculars. And it's a whole teaching. They have a book on teaching on this. People are reading the book of Jasha, the books of Enoch. They've not read John. They've not read Matthew. The major things that are measured on, where emphasis was put by Christ. Why go to the book of Enoch? Because Jude quotes Enoch somewhere. So we are there going to, no, this is very enough. People like Smith Wigglesworth that we still read about, this is all they read. This is all. Smith Wigglesworth didn't even read a book about God's generous. It was not there. It was not written. And today we are reading about him. We are still amazed at what he did by just reading this. His English was not even good. You know, you being from England and your English, your English is not good. That is bad. You know what I'm saying? And he shook this world up to today. You know, you speak of Smith Wigglesworth, you think he's still alive. You think he's still preaching. Man died more than, what, 70 years ago. He's still here. Knowing yourself in this world, liberty will not be taken away from you. People will stand on the platform like this and rip you of the liberty that you were bought into. Hallelujah. But you should not. Go read Galatians chapter 3, read from verse 15. Paul is telling them what had been prophesied to Abraham, the law which came 430 years later could not annul. It could not remove. So many of these things we are sticking to, oh, you see, Daniel had to fast for 21 days for his prayer to be answered. Jesus had not died. Isaiah says, Rent the heavens. You get it? Rent the heavens. He's prophesying. Who shall open the heavens for us? Who shall ascend for us? And Christ came. And when he was baptized, the heavens were rent. They were opened. Praise the Lord. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came. There is no more heaven to be. You can't live that way. You need to put a hole into heaven. You need to put. No. 
when if you got born again, how did God pass through that heaven to come to you, to come into your heart? If he was able to come, he still can come even without that heaven being torn. There is a closed heaven here. There is a closed heaven over me. There is a closed heaven over me. It is so sad to see how the church has been bound by things that are not scriptural. Because as long as somebody is a good orator, they have a good tie, they have a good following, whatever they are saying is true. Let it be tested by the word of God. Throw away the carnal nature that the carnal nature is a nature of toiling that does not require rest. So in somebody here's how simple it is. Even today, look at our world. It is easier for them to believe bad news. People don't want to believe good news. You're telling people Christ did it. There is no generational curse. There is no courtroom you need to go to. There is no, there is no oh, prophetic what? price you need to pay for you to be free. It is here. You can be free on your own. They don't want that. Why? Because it doesn't seem like they worked for it. That is why Jesus came. Because you could not work for it. The bondage that the law had put people in and yet it availed nothing. Christ came and he accomplished on the cross. And that is why he tells us to walk in the finished works of Christ. And that is why he tells us to live the teaching of dead works, the doctrine of dead works. What are the dead works that you must earn what Christ gave? You must just release what Christ already gave. You must not earn. I see this a lot. Even recently we were praying, I think, with, for somebody with Steve. Well, like when praying for people to speak in tongues, tell them I've prayed for them. Be filled in the name of Jesus. Now open your mouth and start worshiping God. And like, oh, Father, please fill me. Please fill. They feel like they've not worked enough. They feel like, Pastor, it can't be a prayer of three words. You get, they feel like that's not enough. Like, Pastor, we need to engage. We are not even yet sweating. How can God just do without us sweating? Why do you want to live under the curse? There is a man that came and paid. There is a man who paid a better sacrifice. He came with his blood, not blood of bulls and goats, which would sometimes fail. He came with his own blood, obtained redemption for us once and for all. That is what he says. Now, what do we do as Christians? We learn to walk in that. And you see, you may say, oh, but why is it that not every Christian praise and sees results and what? It is because there is growth. It is not that God is holding back. No, God has already given fully. It is growth. You see, as you grow, you learn to release. Praise the Lord. You learn to release. It is just like a child, an heir, who, who is just discovering their inheritance. You get it? We've been told, oh, there is here, there is land the other side, there is land the other side. Talk to so-and-so, the CEO. So you see, today they may be living here because they've not talked to their lawyer. You get it? So they are going, walking around, boarding a matatu, being bitten by bed bugs, and... <laughs> yeah, they are matatus with bed bugs. <laughs> One time I asked, the, 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 there is a seat that was very funny, so I told the makanga, hey, this, this one may even have bed bugs. So the makanga asked me, eh, from where? <laughs> are you not the ones who, who bring... <laughs> Eh? He says, <laughs> eh? for us, when we bought this guy, it had no bed bugs. It, mu <laughs> it must be you, the passengers. <laughs> and I told him, actually, you're right. <laughs> no, but imagine this guy is there using this matter to, then another day, they meet the lawyer. And they're like, ah, the other time I didn't have enough time, so you told me about the man on the account. Was there anything more? Yeah, actually, there is also a car. And they get excited and run off. They start driving the car. You get it? They drive the car. Then after some time, they're like, ah, I didn't give that lawyer enough time. There is a jet also. So that's what happens as we are getting our minds renewed. Today you read and you discover healing. So you run healing, but you're broke. Then... <laughs> <laughs> You go back to the, ah, hasn't God said anything about not being broke? <laughs> then you discover. So now you run with healing and prosperity. Then eventually you discover, actually there is peace. Then you keep discovering. So that's what renewal of the mind is. So many Christians have only examined the document to a certain 
detail. They've not, they've not explored it fully. So the more we explore it, the more we live in the fullness of what he's obtained for us. But it is all there. There is nothing that God is going to do anymore about the price that Jesus paid on the cross. He did it all. It was finished. Like we don't tell anyone you need to pray hard to get born again. If anyone opens up their heart, forgiveness was given 2,000 years ago. Righteousness was given 2,000 years ago. Yet he tells us in Romans, if he did not spare his only son, won't he with him give us everything? Won't he give us all things that we need? And I gave you this analogy of the air ticket. You're seated in a plane and you tell the hostess, I don't have like, do you want chicken or what? I advise you to always say both. You get it? They will not refuse. That's why they smile all the time. They are there to make customers feel nice. They don't tell you, no, you can't have both. But you see, when, when they ask you, when you say, oh, I don't want to eat, I, I, I don't have money, they will ask you, do you have a boarding pass? Do you have an air ticket? With the air ticket, all the refreshments come. With him, he gave us everything. With Jesus, he gave us everything. He didn't give Jesus, then he will wait later to give other things after. Let me give Jesus to die for them. Then 2,000 years later, I'll send them prosperity. No, with him, everything came. If you received him, you received everything. Yours is to release. This is the gospel. This is what Kenya needs to hear. This is what this world needs to hear. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Not too deep. Simple. He's made it very plain here. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for everyone that came today.